In the last lecture, we talked about ocean bottom seismics, including the pros and cons of OBS and towed streamer seismics. In this lecture, we discuss land surface seismics. Remember the Gawar oil field in Saudi Arabia? It had 100 billion barrels of reserves. Only one field of this size has been discovered. It is an onshore oil field. Most oil fields in the Middle East are onshore, meaning they are on land, not in the sea, for example. The Middle East has 75% of the world's remaining conventional oil. So we need seismic data acquisition in land to explore, develop, and produce these reserves. Because as we discussed in level 100, seismics is an essential tool for the ENP industry. Land oil fields are not limited to the Middle East. Remember the supergiant oil field Daoing located in China, which was described in level 100. It is another example of a land oil field. Actually, despite the fact that 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by water, the largest oil fields are on average in land, and more of the oil that we consume comes from land than water. Therefore, land seismics is as important as marine seismics. Our objective here is to provide a description of surface land seismic experiments and of land seismic data. We will contrast land and marine seismics to better put the challenges of land seismic data acquisition into perspective. Some of the key learning outcomes are to familiarize yourself with the low velocity layer and its effects on land seismic data. Familiarize yourself with the concepts of linear and nonlinear sweeps. Familiarize yourself with the notion of ground roll. Familiarize yourself with the problem of coupling geophones and land seismics. This is the plan we will use to talk about land seismics. We start by introducing the low velocity layer, also known as low velocity zone. We have seen that in marine seismics, the layer of water overlaying the geology controls the wave types that we can generate and the physical quantities that we can record. This water layer is also responsible for most coherent noise in marine seismic data, namely swell noise, multiples, and ghosts. On land, the low velocity layer, also called LVL, plays a similar role in different ways. What is the low velocity layer? It's the weathering of surface rocks and the laying down of soft sediments over the years, which causes a layer of semi-consolidated surface rocks, which overlies the sedimentary section to be explored. This layer of semi-consolidated surface rocks is known as the weathering layer, or low velocity layer. The term LVL is used because of the low velocities of propagation of P waves and S waves through this layer. Energy trapped in the LVL is responsible for most of the challenges associated with land seismic acquisition and processing. Land seismic acquisition is designed to try to reduce energy trapped in the low velocity layer as much as possible. This picture illustrates the typical P and S wave velocities in the LVL. The velocities are generally lower than one kilometer per second. The thickness of the LVL varies considerably around the world. In some places, it's less than 10 meters, and in other places, it's more than 200 meters, but rarely reaches 500 meters. Let's now talk about the contrast between land and marine acquisitions. Here are two examples of land seismic acquisitions. The picture on top shows a case in which the receivers are planted individually on the ground. The picture on the bottom shows the case in which the receivers are connected through cables so that they can move simultaneously 
from one location to another, just as in marine experiments. Also, we notice that in A, sources consist of buried explosives which require a drilling hole, whereas in B, a vibricized source which does not require any drilling is used. Contrary to marine experiments, every survey on land is different. Here are particular cases. Variability in types of sources, receivers, and acquisition geometries is due to accessibility. For example, in urban areas, we have some places that have streets, houses, and other structures that prohibit us from moving freely. In the jungle, we have no roads and other difficulties of assessing the places where we want to carry out seismic surveys, as illustrated in the top picture. In land, we also have topography problems with variations in land elevations such as mountains and valleys, as well as unconsolidated terrains, such as swamps and sand, as shown in the bottom picture. Yes, we also have large variations in temperature, including land with extreme temperatures, like the deserts and the Arctic, for example. Marine is consistent through all 71% of the Earth's surface it occupies. In contrast, the 29% of the Earth's surface occupied by land varies hugely in temperature, topography, and albedo, which makes seismic acquisition in land very challenging. The key difference between land and marine is that on land, we operate in a heterogeneous solid, whereas in marine environments, most of our operations are conducted in water. So in the figures here, we show that when we are in open areas, we can conduct land experiments similar to marine experiments by having a cable of sensors attached to a boat or a truck. Please remember that S-wave velocity is not zero in solid land. Therefore, the Arctic is land and not marine. So on land, we can use a three-component source by shaking the ground in three directions. We can also use three component geophones to record the ground motion, which can correspond to either particle velocity or particle acceleration. The combination of three component sources and three component receivers is known as a nine component or nine C survey, which presently can be performed only on land. The nine C equals to three C times three C each source component is associated with three component recordings. A geophone is designed to be sensitive only to the component of velocity parallel to the axis of its case. Therefore, three geophones are required to measure all three components of particle velocity. This movement of the case in relation to the stationary coil generates an electrical voltage proportional to the velocity of the coil with respect to the case. The voltage is recorded. The output of a geophone is therefore proportional to the particle velocity in the wave. So the acquisition in a heterogeneous solid can consist of a three component source with each component being able to generate P and S waves although waves generated by the horizontal components of the source are predominantly S waves, whereas the waves generated by the vertical components of the source are predominantly P waves. The receivers can also be three components, which record P and S waves. Distribution of sources and receivers are generally stationary, except in Siberia, where snow streamers can be used, and deserts where sand streamers can be used. Although land seismic acquisitions have the ability to produce nine component data, most of the present acquisitions are limited to buried explosive sources or vibricized sources and vertical geophones, which record the vertical component of particle velocity. By imagining collecting data in the topography illustrated here, you can understand why it is difficult to go beyond certain constraints. 
It is difficult to maneuver a fiber-sized truck in this topography here. It is difficult to tow a cable of receivers and so on. The poor data quality and enormous costs are the results of these constraints. Land seismic acquisitions take, on average, 50 times longer than marine acquisitions. For instance, today, under fair marine conditions, about 80 kilometers squared of data can be collected per day. But a typical land survey will collect less than 2 kilometers squared per day. Please pay attention as we repeat this. Land seismic acquisitions take on average 50 times longer than marine acquisitions. For instance, today under fair marine conditions, about 80 kilometers squared of data can be collected per day. But a typical land survey will collect less than 2 kilometers squared per day. So in marine, we have 80 square kilometers a day of data. And in land, we only have 2 square kilometers a day of data. The most time-consuming task in land acquisition is laying out receivers. On average, 150,000 geophones have to be repeatedly picked up, put down, and maintained in the course of a survey over sometimes difficult topographies or difficultly accessible areas. Drilling shot holes when using explosive sources is another time-consuming task. In some rough terrain, we may face difficulties and huge delays just in moving a vibrosized vehicle from one position to another. Another factor slowing data acquisition is darkness. Due to many hazards that darkness can present, land acquisition is generally conducted only during daylight hours, in contrast to the 24 hour per day recording that takes place in marine experiments. Notice that, just as in the OBS experiments, coupling the geophone to the ground is also critical on land to ensure that we properly measure ground motion. In fact, coupling is one reason why laying down a geophone on land is so time-consuming. Also, notice that both the split spread configuration with the source at the center of its spread and the off-end spread configuration with all of the receivers to one side of the shot point are used in land acquisition, as we can see here. The off-end spread configuration is mostly used in desert terrains and in the Arctic, where there is a clear space for streamer-type experiences. The streamer-type experiences in land are as efficient as marine experiments. Here is a summary of the contrast between towed streamer seismics and surface land seismics. In towed streamer seismics, we have a water layer, whereas in land seismics, we have low velocity layer or LVL, which is also known as a low velocity zone. In towed streamer seismics, we have receivers that are connected through cables and move simultaneously from one location to another. In land seismics, receivers are planted individually on the ground in most cases. In towed streamer seismics, surveys are roughly the same, whereas in land, we have every survey that's different because of variations in accessibility, such as urban areas, jungles, and more. In topography, such as mountains and valleys, and also in extreme temperatures, such as deserts and the Arctic. In towed streamer seismics, we have a source, 1C, and receivers, 1C, 3C, and 4C. On land seismics, we have source 3C and receiver 3C, which is a 9 component or 9C survey with buried explosives and fiber size. In towed streamer seismics, we have 80 kilometers squared of data that's collected per day, 
because 24 hour per day recordings are available. On land, we have two kilometers square per day because of the time of laying down receivers. On average, 150,000 geophones have to be repeatedly picked up, put down, and maintained in the course of a survey. In towed streamer seismics, we have an array of air guns which are towed with streamers. In land seismics, we drill shot holes when using explosive sources, moving large fiber-sized trucks from one shooting position to another. We have darkness. Land acquisition is generally conducted only during daylight hours. Maintaining sensor coupling is another one of the issues. Let's now describe the two most popular seismic sources in land seismics, that is, dynamite and vibrosize. We will start with dynamite. The explosive source on land, also known as dynamite, is detonated in a drilled hole. The figure on the left shows a typical drilling hole of a dynamite source and an illustration of a dynamite explosive. This source can be used in some areas difficult to reach by truck, such as jungles, as well as in places where there are no buildings to damage, no landowners, and no crops, as in some deserts. In many countries, explosive sources are prohibited in populated areas due to the general perception of danger in the use of explosives and the risk of damage to buildings, pipelines, wells, and other infrastructure. Another disadvantage of explosive sources is the need to drill holes. In hard rock countries, the drilling is slow. Let's repeat this. Another disadvantage of explosive sources is the need to drill holes. In hard rock countries, the drilling is very slow. Areas with thick LVL require deep holes which can also slow the drilling process. When the explosives are buried below the low velocity layer, the effect of the weathering layer is significantly reduced. The explosive source on land, again also known as dynamite, is detonated in a drilled hole. The figure on the left shows a typical response of an explosive source on land. Compared to the other land sources, such as vibrosize, the buried explosive sources are broadband. Let's now describe the vibrosize source. The original vibrosize technique was tested by Conoco in 1966 using a vibrator, a mechanical device mounted on a truck. Several trucks may be positioned along a line to make a source array. Vibrator trucks are normally as large as garbage trucks and weigh as much as 50 tons. They have the ability to move along public roads and sometimes they are equipped with individual wheel drive so that they can be driven almost anywhere that can take their weights. The vibrosize technique is popular because the cost of operation is lower than the cost of most alternative sources such as explosive sources, which require shot holes. The biphasized concept is that if a signal containing a known set of frequencies, which are transmitted into the earth, and the received signal at the surface, after extraction of the transmitted signal, we can then produce a signal that is the earth's reflection series. To transmit into the ground a signal containing a known set of frequencies, a steel plate is vibrated on the ground at known frequencies. This plate is known as the base plate. The vibrator truck is driven like a normal motor vehicle to the shot point, or vibrator point in this case, where the base plate is lowered to the ground. After the base plate completes its vibrating and the vibrator point recording is completed, the base plate is lifted up and the vibrator truck is driven to the next vibrator point. 
The base plate of a vibrator is driven by a continuous variable frequency, sinusoidal-like signal. At any particular time, the signal has an instantaneous frequency that lies within the seismic bandwidth. The driving signal is called a sweep because of the way in which the variable frequency sweeps through the seismic bandwidth. When the frequency range is swept from low to high frequencies, it is called an upsweep. A downsweep is a sweep from high to low frequencies. Sweep can also be characterized as linear or nonlinear. The mathematical expression of a nonlinear sweep is st equals a sine phi t equals sine 2 pi f t t. Here are the expressions of phi t and f t. Let me emphasize that these arguments of sine wave vary with time. That is why the vibra size can generate different frequencies. However, the duration of the source signature is long compared to the signature of the dynamite. Each time interval captures different frequencies. When nu equals 1, we have a linear relationship between frequencies and time, as we can see from this mathematical expression. Again, the key difference between linear and nonlinear sweeps is in their rate of change in frequency. Linear sweeps have a constant rate of change, whereas for nonlinear sweeps, the rate of change of frequency is not constant. The basic idea behind nonlinear sweeps is to provide petroleum seismologists some control of relative strengths of frequencies contained in the sweep, thus increasing the chances of improving vertical resolution. The practical implementation of the nonlinear sweep is conducted as follows. The vibrator sweeps slowly through the frequencies we need to strengthen and quickly through those whose strength is already sufficient. For instance, in this figure, the nonlinear sweep spends most of its time at the higher frequencies. We can see that it reaches 70 Hz in about 10 seconds, then spends the remaining 10 seconds sweeping from 70 to 100 Hz. Let's now determine the real source signatures associated with the sweeps in the next slide. In very loose terms, we can think of the sweep as a sum of delay cosine waves. So if these cosine waves are brought back into phase before summation, we can reconstruct the signal represented by the sweep. The resulting time signals of such summation are zero phase and more compact than the sweep. It turns out that this process of phase corrections followed by a summation of cosine waves of the frequency components of the sweep is actually equivalent to taking the autocorrelation of the sweep. WT represents the zero phase signals. In other words, WT is the source signature of data generated by the vibrosize source. Here are examples of linear and nonlinear sweeps in their autocorrelations. The first example shows a linear sweep with a 10 to 100 Hz bandwidth. The second example shows a nonlinear sweep where nu equals 0.5 with a 10 to 100 Hz bandwidth. The third example shows a linear sweep with a 10 to 60 Hz bandwidth. And the fourth example shows a nonlinear sweep where nu equals 0.5 with a 10 to 100 hertz bandwidth. To ensure that the signal actually being transmitted into the ground is the desired sweep signal, a sensor is mounted on the base plate. This sensor produces an output signal that can be compared with the desired sweep signal. The classical method of recovering the reflection series from the signal received by the geophones consists of cross-correlating the received signal by the sweep, where UV is the received signal and UT is the final seismic trace. 
This figure illustrates a reflected signal from three geological boundaries, each reflecting the complete sweep signal at a given time delay. Note that prior to correlation, the signal, as detected at the surface, does not readily indicate event arrival times. Two or more sweeps may be summed to build up the energy level and attenuate random noise. The summed signal is then cross-correlated with the sweep signal. If a reflection event is present, a zero-phase source signature is produced at a point in the correlated trace corresponding to the arrival time of that event. Finally, let's note that the broadband acquisition is also possible in land, especially the ability to record low-frequency components of seismic data. Dynamite and vibricides, for example, contain very low frequencies, which are not attenuated by much of the wave propagation in the Earth. Modern sensors can record seismic waves at frequencies as low as 0.1 hertz or for a period of 100 seconds. Let's now talk about data associated with land seismic acquisition, namely the notion of ground roll and statics. In this figure, we have identified the main seismic events which dominate land data, namely air waves, the ground, direct P and S waves, and reflected and refracted events. The definitions of reflected, refracted, and direct waves were discussed in detail in the section on toad streamer data, or are self-explanatory. The event that requires more detailed discussion here is ground roll, that is, the surface wave. Another important point about land data that we will elaborate on here is the fact that the interface between air and the weathering layer is sometimes non-flat for some terrain. The effects of the non-flatness of this interface on seismic data are known as statics. We will describe these effects later on. The interface air LVL, that is, the air low velocity layer interface, is non-flat for rough terrain it can actually have a very complex shape, thus further complicating the character of land seismic data. The figure on the left shows the snapshots of wave propagation through a medium with a non-flat air low velocity interface. And the figure on the right shows the snapshots of wave propagation through the same medium with a flat air low velocity interface. Comparing the snapshots corresponding with a non-flat air low velocity layer interface with those corresponding to a flat air low velocity layer interface, we can see how the non-flat air low velocity interface further complicates wave propagation on land. The corresponding seismic data for these two cases are shown here. Notice how events are distorted in the figure on the left due to the complexity of the shape of the air LVL interface. We can hardly recognize the hyperbolic move out in the figure on the left. These distortions are known as statics. Correcting for these distortions so that the seismic data on the left figure can resemble the data in the right figure is called static corrections. In other words, Static corrections aim at eliminating the effect of free surface topography from seismic data. Again, the reciprocity is an important tool in data analysis as described in the previous lectures in the context of toad streamer seismics. The reciprocity of toad streamer seismics is different from the reciprocity in land seismics because in toad streamer seismics, we are dealing with scalars, which in land, we are dealing with vectors. Our objective here is to describe the reciprocity for land seismics. In experiment number one, we have the vertical displacement due to the horizontal source distribution. In experiment number two, 
we have the horizontal displacement due to the vertical source distribution. These two experiences are reciprocal. Notice that the vector orientation is very important here. Now we consider the case in which the source is arbitrarily oriented in experiment one. In experiment two, the displacement must have the same orientation as the source in experiment number one. That is what this figure indicates. So reciprocal configurations for arbitrarily oriented sources and receivers UA is the vector displacement due to the source distribution FA, whereas UB is the vector displacement due to the source distribution FB. Here is the general formula of the reciprocity on land. This relationship holds for general and homogeneous anisotropic linearly elastic media. The brackets here denote the scalar product, also known as dot product. That is, when we can represent the sources by delta functions to indicate specific locations of the source as there are point sources. Alpha and beta here are the unit vectors of the sources. They indicate the directions in which the sources are applied. AT is the source signature. By substituting point sources and point receivers in the reciprocity theorem equation, we arrive at the following result, which means that the inner product of the displacement with the applied force is the same in both cases. Note that UA is the vector displacement at the receivers that we denote here XB due to a source at the point XA and that for the reciprocal experiment, UB is the vector displacement at the receivers that we denote here XA due to a source at the point XB. When the source and receiver points are variables of the seismic wave field, the vector displacements UA and UB can be described as a function of source points and receiver points as shown here. Here is the reciprocity formula for the particular case of source point and receiver point. We have assumed that the two experiments have used the same source signatures. So only the directions, beta and alpha, of the source vector and displacement vectors are critical in this formula. If beta represents a vertical source at XB and alpha is a horizontal source, for example, a shear vibrator, at XA, then the output of a horizontal geophone at XA will be identical to the output of a vertical geophone at XB. This case is illustrated here. In towed streamer marine acquisition, we are dealing with pressure sources and hydrophones as receivers. Thus, reciprocity applies without the directionality restriction because pressure sources and hydrophones are scalars. So the reciprocity theorem can be restated here. Notice that the scalar products are gone as we are dealing with scalar quantities only at this time. PA XT is the pressure at position X at time T due to a scalar source distribution. SA X whereas PB XT is the pressure at position X at time T due to a scalar source distribution, SB XT. Notice that the inner product is not used here because we are dealing with scalar quantities only. Again, this equation is greatly simplified if we are dealing with point sources and point receivers as is the case in today's seismic acquisition. Here are the definitions of point sources and point receivers by using delta functions. We arrive at the following result, which says that the pressure response is the same in the two cases. That is, 
the pressure at XB due to a point pressure source at XA is the same as the pressure at XA due to a point pressure source at XB. Let's now talk about seismics in the transition zone. A transition zone, also called a mixed terrain zone, is a region where environments change rapidly from land to the near onshore coast and vice versa. Because ships are limited by the water depth in which they can safely be used to conduct operations, and because land operations must terminate when the source approaches the water's edge, transition zone recording techniques must be employed if a continuous seismic profile is required over the land and then into the sea. This figure shows an example of a transition zone. As we can expect, different coastlines require different equipment. One has to be imaginative and work on a case-by-case -case basis. There are no standard acquisition geometries in transition zones yet. Transition zone experiments are often more labor intensive than either land or marine experiments and it is often more expensive to conduct them and to process the resulting data. With people claiming vaster areas of subsea land through dike building, transition zones are being artificially expanded. Therefore, scientific progress in the acquisition and processing of transition zone data can be very beneficial in the long run. Again, because ships are limited by the water depth, and because land operations must terminate when the source approaches the water's edge, transition zone recording techniques are required. Typically, transition zone experiments use three classical seismic sources, air guns, land-buried explosives, dynamite, and vibrosize. The two types of receivers are geophones and hydrophones. Several combinations of sources and receivers are possible. In some areas, we may record particle velocity from the pressure source. In another, we may record pressure from the dynamite source. One of the daunting tasks in seismic processing is calibrating these different measurements with different statics and different low velocity layers. So far, most of the efforts have been limited to phase calibration. More progress on amplitude calibration or an even more general approach to imaging which integrates different sources and receiver types is expected in coming years. This figure summarizes better than words the challenges of mixed terrain acquisition. It shows a map of an example of a transition zone survey near the port of Rotterdam in the Netherlands. This survey was conducted by Shell and ExxonMobil. This figure schematizes personnel and seismic equipment involved in this survey. Remember, there is a large selection of iMode education lectures, which can further enhance your knowledge of wave propagation, elasticity, electromagnetism, wave field sampling, wave field decomposition, and imaging. Thank you for listening to this iMode education lecture.